Okay, so we're gonna move on to another. We're gonna move on to another uh, Ian Smith story. Okay, and today we're gonna look at the story called Home. And uh, this story concerns itself with. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, this uh, story concerns itself with <clears throat> a couple of different ideas. Uh, see all right so basically uh what this story concerns itself with is a couple of different ideas like i said okay one of them one of them is the idea of uh let's say the difference between one of them is the idea of say like supremacy or the desire to be seen as better than other people so essentially the uh, main characters in the story, the couple, um, have a strong desire and a need, especially the the man, but mo both of them actually have this uh, strong desire and need to be seen as superior, to be seen as superior. They have a real inferiority complex in terms of, they have a real sense of insecurity, especially the man, has a real sense of insecurity in terms of his own value, his own worth, and needs needs validation okay he needs validation in order to really feel good about himself basically and to feel like he's not a loser yet so there's one angle another sort of central idea or, or th uh, theme in this text uh, is the idea of uh, belonging in other words where do you belong or where are you from uh what do you claim or what place maybe even what do you claim as your home and what place claims you as belonging to it? So uh, the man, this, the overall story, before we get into it specifically, the overall story is the couple go back to where they grew up, okay, when they were poor, mm -hmm. um, before they moved to South, uh, South uh, Africa. So the couple go back to their where they grew up, which is uh, somewhere in Glasgow, uh, when they were quite poor, it's like a working class area, some area, we're not told where it is, but um, maybe Mary Hill somewhere. <laughs> Mary Hill, Post Park, one of the places, yeah, one of the flipping, one of the nice places in Glasgow, yeah. And um, anyway, so they come back and uh, they they come back because the man essentially wants to brag about everything that he's achieved and he wants to show off and more fundamentally he wants to gain the validation of the people who were there so that they, what he wants basically is to go back to this place where people are less well off, struggling, just working hard to get by, um, doing their best to, you know, have a good life in what whatever opportunity or lack of opportunity based on whatever lack of opportunity they have just trying to make the most of it he wants to come back okay with his fancy car and fancy clothes and his fancy wife and he wants them to all be amazed by him basically he's like a like a poser basically okay hyper insecure and an extreme need for validation which basically means someone telling him wow you've done great like that yeah patting him on the head kind of thing Okay, so there is the overview. There's the overview of the story. And um all right, so now let's actually get into the into the text itself. Okay. Um all right. So again the title is home, okay, because he returns to what he considered his home. Um but based on the reception that he gets when he when he's there and the way that he behaves, uh that's gonna be put into question. Okay, where where he actually belongs in what he what he belongs to okay okay so it begins the black polished car drew up outside the brown tenement okay so he's in the hood yeah he's back to the back to the uh, place where he came from outside the brown tenement he rested for a moment his hands still on the wheel he was a big man with weather beaten red veined face and a strong jaw one one finger on the right hand was square red ring he looked competent and hard Okay, so now just uh, based on this introduction, okay, you would think that the man being described is not the man that 
I described to you, right? You would think that the man being described is going to be one that's like some kind of cool person, okay? One that's some kind of like uh, action hero, like some kind of actually admirable person. You know, based on how he's described, yeah, he sounds kind of like he's cool, yeah. He, so he sounds cool, yeah. Now, what this, what this goes to the heart of, okay, is it actually connects one to one with what I'm saying. Which is that the key is he sounds cool, he looks cool, he looks successful, sounds successful. So fundamentally, this man, okay, and his wife too, uh, these are people that the they have placed all their value on their appearance, essentially, on creating an image of success. So it's not just a car, but it's a shiny car, okay, which has been polished. Which um means that he went through the trouble of getting it polished before he took this trip back to where he back to the area he grew up in. Meaning he's gone through extra lengths in order to try to impress the people that he's gonna go meet. Even though the reality is that the people he's gonna meet are people that are struggling. Okay, they're struggling to pay the bills. You know the struggle yet. Struggling to pay the bills, struggling to feed the kids, struggling the gas bill, electric bill, and all that. So he doesn't have to do all this yet. It's kind of like overkill. He's going to extreme lengths. He's wearing like a ruby ring. Um, and we're not told if it's a ruby or not, which indicates maybe it's not a ruby. It just looks like one. And he's got a fancy car, which is all shiny. And he's essentially going to flex on poor people, yeah, on poor people, which is weird, yeah, it's strange. It's one thing if he was going there because he's going to meet his friends or something and... He's got family there or people that love him there. And he's going there in order to, say, inspire or to talk or, you know, even hand out and help help people that are there. He's going to do something good, philanthropic, yeah, useful, helpful. But he's not. He's going there so he can flex. He's going there so that he can flex. Okay. All right. Anyway, so the point is, he's all image. Yeah, that's the point. There's nothing underneath except insecurity and fear. Okay, and we'll get to that in a second. Okay, anyway, after a while, he got out gazing around him, uh, up at the sky with a hungry look as if you're scanning the veldt. The veldt is in Africa, meaning the place where the wildlife roam, like lions and all that. Uh, so again, even the way he, even the way he acts, behaves, he acts like he's strong, fierce, tough, and you're gonna see the reality of that. Um later on the story okay now we get to his wife his wife in furs uh, she's wearing furs to the hood yeah she's gonna get robbed <laughs> not very smart yet anyway she's wearing furs yeah what the heck? she's wearing furs got out more slowly her face had a haggard brownness like that of a desiccated gypsy so some of the language here questionable desiccated means like a coconut that's uh you know, desiccate coconut, yeah, like, you, you scrape it up. It's that coconut thing, yeah, you scrape it up, and it tastes good, yeah, you put it on ice cream or whatever. Anyway, her face is like that, yeah, it's like a messed up coconut, so she's like, low-key, she ain't really got it together, yeah, she's struggling, yeah. <laughs> she's struggling to get it together. <laughs> Too much time in the sun or something, yeah, to, I don't know. Anyway, seemed to be held together like a lacy bag, <laughs> So she's struggling, yeah. She's struggling to keep it together, yeah. All right. He glanced up at the tenement with the cheerful animation of one who had left it, and yet with a certain curiosity, and yet with a certain curiosity, yeah. he's looking at it like he's at a zoo or something, yeah. He's looking at it like he's at the zoo, something like that, yeah. It's weird. Lock the car, dear, said his wife. He stared at her for a moment in surprise, and as if he had been listening to a witticism, a joke. But they don't steal things here. Okay. So... What you're going to see also in this story, okay, is that not only do these people have a strong desire to feel better than other people, as in to feel better than the people who live in this area, yeah, this, uh, you know, less well-off area, they have the strong desire to flex on them and feel good about <clears throat> having more money or whatever than them, which is stupid in itself, yeah, because it's equating individual value to money which is just dumb yeah basic thing think about this yeah if you think that the more money a person has the better they are 
he's he's I'm better than you because I'm rich and you're broke, as people say uh, stupid things like this. I'm better than you because I'm rich and you're poor. Or, man, he's better than me or she's better than me because she's rich and I'm poor. Yet people think this way is a stupid idea. Think about it this way. Pretend today you're you have money. You have a lot of money. And again, even that's subjective. What is a lot of money? Let's just say in general, pretend you have what you would consider a lot of money. Okay, so today, wow, you're amazing, right? You're great. You're great. Lots of personal value. Say tomorrow, some accident happens, you lose all your money. Does that mean now that you have no value? And then the next day, say, magically, you get your money back. Does that mean you have your value again? Okay, what about when the value, say, say every hour you're making a little bit more money? Does that mean your value, what you're worth as a person is going up? What if the market changes and it starts to go the other way? And now, do you see the craziness that you get into when you start to equate your personal value as an individual with some kind of arbitrary external figure, like money? It gets, it's even worse than you think because when you ask the question, what is money itself worth? How much money do I have? If you know anything about how money works, the value of your money is determined not by the money itself, but by other people, yeah, by the market, by people's decisions. Yeah. So the thing that you're using to measure yourself against doesn't even have any value in itself. Yeah. Anyway, the whole thing is the is stupid yet. Yeah. The point is the whole thing's dumb yet. Yeah. You already have all the value that you can have yet. Yeah. You have infinite value. And you know this already because when you look at a baby, you don't say you look at two children, okay, two babies, infants. One is, you don't you don't ask, you know, this one has no money, and so, okay, let's forget about him, let's not treat him nicely. And this one has money, let's treat him nice, let's treat him nicely. No, you see children, right? You see, this is an infant, and this is an infant. We're going to treat both as best we can, yeah. That's, so it doesn't change once the infant gets bigger, yeah, matures and everything. Anyway, I say all that to say it's a stupid idea, yeah. The point is, it's a dumb idea that, your your value, your individual worth is equated to money. It's stupid. It doesn't work practically. It doesn't work if you try and work it out. You can't measure it. It's And then it leads to you feeling terrible about yourself or great about yourself for a minute and then terrible about yourself after. So just don't think that way. In any case, they think this way, okay, which is why you see that they're hyper insecure and they're doing stupid things like trying to go back to the flipping hood to flex, yeah, which is dumb, yeah. In any case... Beyond just trying to, beyond just trying to, um, beyond just trying to feel superior to other people in this weird way, they also know they also have a broken relationship in which they they constantly try to feel superior to each other. Okay, they work to feel superior to each other. So what you'll notice, okay, all throughout the relationship, it's like a power game that they play in terms of who's more value who who who's you know who's more important in, in the relationship okay i'm better than you are basically or i made you successful you are nothing without me that kind of thing yeah so you see that initial you see the beginnings of that here okay which is that the wife says to him lock the car dear yeah she gives him like she gives him like a passive aggressive command yeah she gives him a passive aggressive command she doesn't say, can you please lock the car? She doesn't say, can you lock the car? She doesn't say, you know, or she doesn't lock it herself. You know what I'm saying? She gives him a command, yeah. She says, lock the car, dear, which is lock the car, command. And then the dear on the end is like a little smoke screen kind of thing, yeah. It's like a, so she doesn't come off rude or something, yeah. In any case, the, the effect that it has is he stares at her. Okay, because it triggers his insecurity and it also triggers uh, him in that he knows what she's doing. Okay, he, she's now taking the position that she's better than he is. So she can tell him what to do. She's the leader. She's in charge. She's the boss. And so he stares at her and he has a he ha his ego and insecurity is very big. And so he takes it. He takes it as if what she said is a joke takes it like a joke yeah he doesn't take her seriously basically the things she says he doesn't take seriously and then he replies with but they don't steal things here but they don't steal things here which which 
indicates a couple different things here. One, it indicates that, and what I should say is, oh yeah, if you're wondering, you know, we haven't really gone much into the story. Uh, the things I'm telling you, the the things I'm telling you are found throughout the story. So I'm really, I'm telling you this, I'm telling you the story of the story, even though we haven't really gone into it. Uh, because what you need to remember is that any text revolves around its central ideas or its so every text has certain things which it talks about mainly everything in the text revolves around those things which it talks about it makes sense so even if i just spent the whole hour or whatever however long this video is going to go for even if i spend the whole time just on one sentence i could explain to you the entire text from that one sentence pretty much um because the entire text revolves around Meaning every line in the text revolves around or is attached to the central idea or ideas. Because obviously that's what the story is about. Yet. So like the every, every leaf on the tree is connected to the central trunk of the tree with the branches. Yeah. So every branch on the tree, if you follow it back, it gets to the central trunk. Makes sense. And it gets to the roots. They're all connected. Okay? That makes sense. So every line of the text, which is like the branches, is connected to the central ideas of the text. That's where they come from, basically. Okay, anyway, so what I was saying was... What the heck was I saying? Huh, so what, it, what I was saying was, what this illustrates to me, okay, is that it tells you about the person, these two. <clears throat> tells you about the man. Tells you about the man. When he says that they don't steal things here, okay. What it tells you is that he ha he he has become very detached from from his uh his what do you call it his upbringing. Yeah, he's become very detached to re from reality. He doesn't he is not now looking at things as they are, but he's now again because he's he lied to himself so much about I'm this big shot and all that. You know, to try and feel good about himself, he can. He lives in lies, and therefore now he. This is the problem with with lying a lot. It's you begin to mess up how you see the world. Yeah, your perspective on reality mess gets messed up. In any case, in any case, um, he's detached. Yeah, look, he's in the he's in the hood with a fancy car. Yeah, people are hungry. See, the thing is, look, the thing is that. When a man's hungry, okay, when a man's hungry and you are walking in front of his house uh, with, say, you got a fancy chain on or something, uh, it's not personal yet if he robs you. It's not personal. It's like, I'm not saying he should yet. I'm not saying it's ethical for him to do it or he's justified. Of course not. He's not. But the thing is, he's if a man's hungry and his kids are hungry and he's struggling to feed his family... And now you pull up, and your wife's in a fur coat. You got a fancy ring on. You got a fancy car. And you're not from here. And then you're a lick. Yeah, you're like a. You're like a. <laughs> you're like a. What's that thing in Call of Duty? The that airdrop. What's it called? The care package. You're like a care package. Yeah, you're like a care package. Came in from the sky. Yeah. So people are hungry. Yeah. And you look like you got a lot to share. Yeah. So people. So he's not attached to reality. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's the point. He's not attached to reality. And then two, just very quickly, is I would say that even if he, in his head, has some inclination that, you know, there's a chance he could get robbed and people do steal things. I would say that he also says this based on his own ego and his own misunderstanding of who he is and how much power he actually has and how much people respect him. Because he believes, okay, like the type of way he's talking, like leave the car door open, no one's going to do anything. He's talking like a, like a mafia boss or he's talking like someone who's well respected in the place. Yeah. So he has he has an idea of himself. Let me put it this way. He is projecting an idea of himself, an image of himself, which is. I'm so strong, I'm so powerful, I'm so great, I'm so loved and respected that no one will touch my car like that, yeah? And I say projecting because he himself doesn't actually believe this, and we'll see that. 
uh, based on his behavior in a minute. Okay, so all that happens, so they arrive at the the place they're at, yeah, whichever area it is. They're in front of the <clears throat> they're in front of the street in the front of the tenement. Um so they're in the area and they start talking about who the people used to live here or Jameson and all that. It's a little bit of kind of history of Glasgow in a way, talking about the conflict between Catholics and Protestants back in the day. And then talking about how people sort of are being moved out of their, <clears throat> excuse me, are being moved out of their places that they, you know, the local areas and the sort of old housing, the tenements, which wasn't built very well, but it included, it, it bonded a lot of communities together, despite having like, you know, not, not the best conditions, like sort of bad conditions, uh, but a lot of communities were sort of kept together in those tenements. Um, there were neighbors and all that. And then eventually uh, when the high flats got built, which is another way of saying like big apartment buildings in the seventies or something, then these communities sort of got moved and split apart. Yeah. Which was well-intentioned. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I haven't looked into it enough. Maybe well-intentioned, but the result uh, wasn't, it wasn't so great, at least for some people. Okay. So they keep talking they keep talking about people who used to live there and then people they used to know, all that. And looking at different places, I wonder if there's you know, this person's here or that person's there. Eventually, they go past a coal house. Now, I'll be honest, I don't exactly know what a coal house is. I can assume maybe it's where people used to go and get their coal for maybe their house fire because, you know, back in the day, they didn't have... Not everyone had electricity, believe it or not. Not everyone even had a bathroom. So back in the day in Glasgow, uh, people shared a bathroom in their... It was a communal bathroom. Not like a big one. like Not like the bathroom in your school, work, or university, but like a, like a bathroom, like the one in your house. Everyone in the, in the building shared that bathroom because it was in the middle... It was in the... It was in the... What we call the close. It was in the... The stairwell, huh? the stairwell, the bathroom would be in there. Obviously, you know, behind the door and all that, it'd be in there. And then people, the neighbors would take turns like using it. Yeah, so it was a struggle. Huh? People really struggled back in the day. So I'm assuming this is, you know, connected to that. It's like about coal used for the fire to heat, heat up your house. But I'm not sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anyway, so when the wife, when the wife walks past this, okay, um, when the wife walks past this, she does her best to keep her. She does her best to keep her jacket away, from. Uh, she does her best to keep her jacket, her fancy jacket, away from the, the, doors uh, of these like coal houses. Now. It's a very simple, you know, metaphor here. Very simple image. The fur coat is the idea of our vision of herself as successful or you could say the fur coat represents the way the wife sees herself okay so she does her best to keep her coat away from these houses which represent the people who live there the ordinary people the working class people the quote-unquote poor people and so she does her best to keep herself away from the poor, from the ordinary person, the working class person, the everyday person. And therefore, in a way, you can say she looks down on them, just like her husband. She looks down on them. She thinks that they're dirty, like the coal, and that it will get on her, it'll get on her fancy jacket, mess up her jacket. And she looks at them the way that you would look at something that's going to stain your clothing, something to be avoided, not be touched, not be... Don't go near it. Don't touch it. It's dirty. It's something you don't want to be around. It's smelly. That's how she sees the poor. That's how they see the poor, the working class, the ordinary person, the average person. Now, obviously, the irony of this is that these two people are <laughs> way more the type of people that you'd want to avoid, huh? that stain you just from their, <laughs> from their energy, from being around them, yeah. Uh, blacken your day, uh, mess up your day. 
just from talking to them. Yeah, you don't want to have a conversation with them. You want to avoid them. Yeah, uh, and if you met them, you'd probably want to uh, end the the meeting as soon as you can, as soon as you could. Okay. Anyway, anyway, he goes on to say you now talking about um uh, the when when he was living here and uh, renting renting a place, an apartment, whatever a house here, and he when he went to the person that was the property manager, we can assume that's what the factor is talking about, property manager, and uh the he he asked the property manager uh for help with the house because the house is uh uh the house is sort of damaged in some way. Okay, it's got rain coming through the roof. Okay, normal thing. Um and the manager basically uh uh sort of like looks down on him. The manager basically uh treats him uh badly basically okay the manager has the energy that he has now yeah so the ma the this factor what he's called the factor property manager factor uh he basically looks down on the man the way that now this man looks down on everyone else that makes sense so you could say maybe this is his original trauma that made him have this major insecurity and made him then develop his desire and dream that one day I'm going to get rich and one day uh, I'm going to flex on everyone. Uh, one day I'm going to flex on everyone. And um, before you feel too sorry for him, before you start to think maybe he's a tragic hero or something, you can see already that this in itself was not the, was not actually the spark of his, uh, of his stupid thinking yet, of his in, of his superiority type thinking, you can see already even what he says in terms of his own commentary on it. He says, "By God, I was treated like a black, like a black," and he's not saying that in a good way. Yet. He's saying that I was treated like a a nobody, like a worthless person, which he calls a black. Meaning in his head, black people are worthless, no value. So and he was saying that back then, yeah. He was thinking that back then. So you can see, okay, that the man has always been stupid, yeah, messed up in his thinking, and that the seeds of this uh, desire for superiority have always kind of been there, yeah. So you can't really feel sorry for him. Um, essentially, his his uh, his terrible character is a product of his own creation his own choosing, which is essentially how, how it works in real life. How it works. Okay. And you can see, just like I was saying, yeah, so he had that desire that one day I'm going to prove this guy wrong. I'm going to show him. I'm going to show him. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, now there's a thing in the in the story which is kind of questionable. I don't understand it. But then a black would buy a bicycle and forget all about his humiliation. Blacks weren't like us. So obviously this is the man thinking, this is the man talking. But what it means by a bicycle and forget about his humiliation, I don't, I'll be honest, I don't understand. Obviously blacks weren't like us, that's simple, yeah, that's simple. Superiority complex. Um, and when I said before he has an inferiority complex, what I mean is he is extremely insecure, yeah. So despite all his fancy clothes and despite all his fancy um you know, way of thinking, no, way of dressing and talking and acting. In reality, he does all that because inside, he feels inferior. He feels like he is still a nobody. Even though he never was a nobody, but he feels like a nobody. That's the point, right? It's like, um, why does a person flex how much money they have all the time? Yet? I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. Why do they do that? They do that because they're trying to convince themselves that they're rich. Like, for example, a person that says, um, what's another common thing? Oh, I'm smart. I'm really smart. I'm really smart. I got 500 degrees. I'm really smart. <laughs> I got a PhD, a master's, blah, blah, blah. It's because they're trying to convince themselves. Yeah, they're trying to convince themselves. They are hypersensitive to judgment. And so they're they're trying to protect themselves essentially from you saying anything which could be perceived as critical because in their selves they don't actually believe 
that they're smart or rich or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, the person who is actually these things, they don't have to flex them yet. They just, they, like, you don't have to flex, for example, that you can walk, even though it's a big gift, blessing. But no one says, I can walk. I'm a great walker yet. <laughs> you think, what's wrong with you yet? I can walk. Yeah. They don't flex that way because it's, we know you can walk. Yeah. Just walk, show us, yeah. You can walk. Then <laughs> we know you can walk. So a person who, a person who is doesn't have to prove they are. Huh? If you, if you, um, if you really are the thing, you don't have to prove you are the thing. Does that make sense? It's only when you don't believe you're the thing, then you have to feel like you have to, uh, then you feel like you have to prove that you are the thing. Does that make sense? And then, um, you know, when someone says, oh, he's really cool, or she's really cool, what they mean, essentially, is they don't have the need for validation, or at least they don't have much need for validation. It means they don't ask people, for example, to confirm uh, what they think about themselves. They just live it and they express it, what they think. Does that make sense? It's the opposite that people have a uh, have a aversion to that they think like, you know, this person isn't so cool or I don't you know, uh, this person's kind of weird or weak or something. It's it's when the other person has a strong need for validation. Does that make sense? Now, if you if you if you have a strong need for validation, it's not necessarily again a curse or something that's a, a death sentence. It's just something to work on. Yeah, like everything else. Yeah, no one's perfect, obviously. Okay. Anyway, you have more of the uh, the couple. Power, playing the power game, like I said. You have more of the couple playing the power game. Like this, she actually says, it was me that drove you to the top. Basically, I made you what you are. I made you great. And then, again, look, this shows you his insecurity. That it, He's extremely sensitive to criticism. It really hurts him. Like a bull winded in the arena. <clears throat> like a bull winded in the arena. Obviously, it's a metaphor. A bull is a very strong, powerful, dangerous, you know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, celebrated in some cultures, worshipped uh, thing. Uh, but but when the bull is stabbed, like in uh, with the matadors in uh, in Spain, when when the bullfighter stabs the bull. Uh, it takes a lot of the power out of the bull and until the bull eventually dies, yeah, unfortunately. But in any case, the point is that she she knows how to stab him. It's similar to mother and son, but obviously that's more extreme and that's abuse. To some extent, I guess you can say that they abuse each other as well as themselves. Um, so she knows exactly what to say to him, to stab him. It's a very toxic kind of relationship, yeah. Um, she, she, she knows what to say to him, to stab him, and hurt him in a way, just with her words, yeah, so, she's one of them girls you need to dodge, yeah, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, they're both kind of perfect for each other, yeah, they're both messed up, so, I guess it's a good match, yeah, in any case, that's what's happening here, boom, 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 he, she says, you're lazy, what's wrong with you, it's a bunch of criticisms, a bunch of criticisms, and then if you notice how he reacts to the criticisms, okay, this is his words. These are her words. Okay. You were lazy. These are her words. You were lazy. You like being with the boys. This is his words. You notice how he reacts. And this is what confirms to me again that his confidence and his his belief in himself and his ideas about himself are not what he actually believes. Belief is communicated through action. Okay. Through action. How people act. And to some extent, Yes, even though he's speaking here, what well, it's a reaction that's being expressed. Okay, so if he actually believed, if he believed what he said, he was actually confident and and believed that he was successful. He believed and knew that 
he was self-made and worthy of celebration, nothing his wife would, was saying here would affect him. She says, I drove you to the top. If he actually believed that he's self-made, he'd laugh at it and say, yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. You did great. Yeah. He could laugh at because it, it doesn't mean anything to him. He'd laugh at it. Or he'd flip it on her and like tease her in some way back yet. Something, I don't know. He, she says, I drove you to the top. And then he'd say something. He drove me insane, yeah, something. He drove me to the mental asylum, something like that, yeah. I don't know yet, but you get what I'm saying, right? He wouldn't he wouldn't be hurt by it. Does that make sense? And if you notice the way he reacts, it's not only that he's hurt by it, but he begins to explain himself. He begins to explain himself, which is another way of saying he begins to seek validation okay here's my reasons are they not good enough are they not good here's my you know what you're saying here's my proof for why you're wrong don't you agree with me like that yeah which is again indication that he doesn't doesn't believe in himself the way that he's making out okay anyway so anyway so uh they continue walking around the place and then eventually Eventually, he's talking very loud. Okay, so people start to tell him to be quiet because it's nighttime. So again, kind of um, arrogant choice. He went to the place at nighttime, and um, he went to the place at nighttime, and he's talking so loudly that he's waking people up. So again, no real respect for the people who live there. He's not authentically connected to this place. You know, the reality is, you know, people have a lot of ideas about like the hood or like the girl yeah or like the, the estate whatever the block people have a lot of ideas about what it what it's like to grow up there oh if you get there you're gonna get stabbed yeah if you go there you're gonna get stabbed you're gonna get shot or something the reality is yeah most people most people in these places they're just they're just good people yeah like you and others but the reality is is just they have been born into a more difficult situation so they're just trying their best to <clears throat> make the best of what they have, yeah, pretty much. And fundamentally, all they want is just the same as what you want. Yeah. They just want respect. That's it, fundamentally. So if you go to these places, okay, or if you're, and you'll know, yeah, if you're born here, like me, if you're born in one of these places, if a person's respectful, yeah, you're going to look after him. You're not even going to, not only would you not do something to him, <laughs> as if you're some kind of, as if you're born like some kind of animals. <laughs> As if people in these places are born like more. <laughs> you're born with a desire a desire to steal or something. <laughs> so, it's like you're born in a certain postcode, so now you have a desire to steal yet. Yeah, you're just excited about stealing something. No, obviously not. You're not only would you not like rob the person, but um you're gonna you're gonna look after them, yeah. If, if I see someone in my area and they look lost or something, I'll probably walk up to them and be like, yo, you okay? And if someone was saying something to them or doing something to them, I would step in for them, yeah. I wouldn't. I'd look after them, yeah. Be like, you okay? So, anyway, respect, that's the key. But with this, with these people, the couple, I mean, they don't have any respect yet. That's the point. They're shouting loudly. People are trying to sleep. And then when the people tell them to be quiet, they don't apologize and they don't um react in a in a very apologetic way but they're just still arrogant in any case so what happens is the man sees that there's a group of it says children yeah but really it's it's like really it's like you could think like teenagers probably yeah teenagers maybe young teenagers something like that yeah and they're around his car, yeah, obviously, because a fancy car in the middle of the in the middle of the street, and these kids probably haven't seen a car like that um parked up in that place, or if they have they haven't seen this car, and so they don't know who this person is yet. they want to investigate <clears throat> so what one one key thing, okay, one key thing this is important to understand the text as well is um. What you need to understand, okay, about these places, about the place being described, is that the community becomes uh, close because there is a need for it to protect itself. 
essentially. Now, this doesn't just mean like gangs and all that. Yeah, that's like a later version form of this. But even just the people who live in the same building together, there is a need for them to know each other, to know who lives here, who doesn't live here, who's their neighbor and all that. Because these areas, like I said, people are struggling. And so you do have more crime yet. And also, you have a higher number, say, of people who would like to engage in crime or engage in unethical behavior are drawn to these places because, or they grow, they stay in these places, okay, because uh, certain households produce certain, like, traumas, which then encourage people to act certain ways and all that. And then also, uh, people that are unethical, often they're not. They don't have a lot of money, so where are they going to stay? It's like Tupac said, yeah. Uh, you ask me why I have a gun, the serial killer lives next to me. He's my neighbor, yeah. <laughs> like you see him on the news, I see him when I go to work, yeah. He's right there, yeah. Anyway, my point is, okay, so people in these places, they need to know each other, yeah. Because it's not like a safe, it's it's not like in a, you know, and a well-to-do, richer area, which is extremely safe, which it doesn't really matter who lives next to you. You don't. It doesn't matter if you know who does or doesn't, because the likelihood of something happening to you, danger-wise, crime-wise, it's very low. Yet, in these cases, in these places, the likelihood of something happening to you, danger-wise, is high. Yeah, it's it's or it's at least if it's not high, it's 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 high enough. It's happened enough times in your life to where you're on guard about it. Yeah. And you're, you're slightly traumatized PTSD by it. So, so this is why, okay. And this is going to be tied to the text now. This is why the kids are extremely curious about whose car is this? Who is this person? Is he a threat? Is he not a threat? What does he want? Why is he here? Like that, huh? They're trying to figure out, this is also why, okay, the number one question, yeah, this is also for me when I was growing up, the number one question which you get taught to ask and you get taught that you will be asked when you grow up in these kind of places is, where are you from? Where are you from? Yeah. And you get taught very quickly that that question is not just like a normal question about... <laughs> <laughs> Your geography, <laughs> your city, you get taught. If someone asks you that question, just be ready. You watch their hands real close. Watch how they're standing real close. Because <laughs> if you give the wrong answer, it's about to be a fight. Yet, yeah. just... so watch them real close. Yet, yeah. you get taught really. Uh, you know, early that you don't ask that question lightly yet, because that's banging on. That's what you call banging on someone. Huh? When you say someone got banged on, that's what that is. Yeah, where you from? Yeah, because what that means is where you from, and should I consider you a threat? <laughs> <laughs> okay, because you need to you need to realize something. Okay, you need to remember that. Again, like I said, in these places, yeah, in these areas, <laughs> every every young man basically is like a like a policeman and a politician, yeah, pretty much in one year. You're the policeman, yeah, because the police it takes a while for them to get here, and 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 by the time they get here, something has already happened, yeah. So often you you often you need to deal with it, yeah. Like it's because it's happening right now, yeah. The bike's getting stolen right now, yeah. People are doing the drugs right now. That woman's getting threatened right now. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> okay. So all right. We need to deal with it. Yeah. Anyway, so so these two, these couple has showed up in this place. And they think they belong here. Yeah. They think that they belong in this place. Okay. But the way that they've acted and behaved demonstrates that they. No, let me change that. They know that they don't belong in this place, as in they don't want to belong in this place. Put it that way. 
they look down on all of these people. They disrespect all of these people. They don't like any of these people. They would not like to live in this place. Okay, the only reason they're here is to hurt these hurt these people who live here. Uh, by 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 showing off their wealth and making them feel bad about themselves. That's why they're here. Okay, so these kids see the car, and they need to they need to ask. So with the question where you're from yet, the point is. The point is that in in these places, everyone essentially knows, even if they haven't talked, you have an idea of who lives in your in your area, in your building or whatever. And so when a stranger shows up in your building, in your area, you ask them often, where are you from? Why? Because you need these people need to know, you need to know, is this person a threat? Okay, because why are they here in my building yet? Why are they here in this place that they don't belong? That's the idea, okay? Because remember, the person asking the question has already experienced a bunch of trauma yet. They've seen people get robbed. They've seen people doing hard drugs, selling hard drugs. They've seen people carrying weapons. They perhaps have carried a weapon themselves for protection. Not to hurt someone, but for protection, because they're afraid of people that are trying to hurt them. They've been through violence. They've seen violence. Okay, so for them, you are not just like a tourist or something. Eh? If you're, a, especially if you're a grown man, and you're here, and I don't know you. Okay, why are you here yet? That's the point. That's the question. Why are you here? Are you a threat or are you not a threat? That's the question. It has to be asked because I have people who live here that I care about. Yeah, I got kids here, or I got loved ones here, friends here. So I need to check you to make sure that you're not going to hurt anyone. Does that make sense? So this same thing that I just described, this happens in the text. Okay, you're gonna see. You're gonna now see the block policemen. <laughs> <laughs> Log policeman, yeah. Two young G's approached. <laughs> okay, so it says two tall youngsters chewing gum approached. Okay. <laughs> hey, mister, what you on about? They stared at him. Now, this is a very weird phrase, yeah. I don't know why he said that, but anyway. Nice bus. Okay, so they make fun of him. Because when the kids were around the car, he shouted at them. Okay, he was mean to them. These are the little kids. He was mean to them, shouted at them, told them to move away from the car. Yeah, so he was mean to them. So these boys, these young guys, have obviously heard him being mean to the kids. So now they're going to make fun of him, check him, and give him a little bit of revenge, yeah, basically. Okay, so they're making fun of him. They're taking the mic out of him. They're going forward. Look, I was just visiting. Look at this. Look at what he says. Huh? Look at what he says. Look at what he says. Boom, boom, boom. So, look, they don't even... Let me even ask. Do they ask him? Where are you from? Let me see. I used to live here. Ha. Huh. Okay, so look, they don't even have to ask him yet. They don't even have to ask him. The first thing he does that, like when they approach him again, this remember how the story started out. The story started out with um, with the man being described like an action hero, yeah, like a bad boy, yeah, who's can handle anything, masculine, strong, and all that, like a like a action hero. But look at how he react, how he reacts when he gets pressed, even just a little bit. They're just joking around with him basically, and they're just they're they're pressing him in a in a in a subtle kind of way, yeah. Which is how it happens normally, yeah. Because they're testing him, yeah. Who are you? Why are you here? Yeah. Why are you making why are you being loud, waking up my uncle? And why are you being mean to the kids, yeah, with your stupid car? So um anyway, anyway, so he begins to explain himself again, yeah. He doesn't they make fun of him, make fun of his car. He doesn't he's not he doesn't show strength as you'd expect from someone who's from someone who's self-made, rich, strong, powerful, all that, the way he portrays himself to be. Like a G, he, he instead, he does the opposite. He ex he begins to explain himself and he begins to, let's not, let's not 
um, he begins to de-escalate and apol apologize, essentially. Okay. <clears throat> Without even apologizing. Actually, I don't think he even says sorry yet. I don't think he says sorry. He just tries to, like, some middle ground, yeah, which is strange. He doesn't even apologize. He's more like, look, I was just visiting. Okay. Like, I have the right to visit. As if he's talking about a zoo or something, yeah. <laughs> then he thought, should he tell him he was a rich man? Who had made it good. He's still thinking of his stupid story and ideas that he wants to flex on on these young guys. Yeah, one of them absent-mindedly kicked one of the tires. Peekaboo! So now they're going over to his wife, and they are now messing with her basically. And all right, boys, he said in an ingratiating voice, "We're going anyway. We've seen all we want." Okay, he's like, all right, all right, let's take it easy, like that, yeah. He's 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 talking to them as if he's their friend, or as if he's, as if it's all good, yeah. He's talking to them like it's all good, and again, it's a weird form of, I'm in control, but it's like, it's like passive enough to not be, to not be, to have a sort of, What's it called? To not be fully, you know, explicitly saying I'm in control and in charge. It's more like a weak. It's like a weak way of saying I'm, uh, you know, it's trying to be in control without sort of, while at the same time trying to avoid conflict. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, it's like a weird, it's a snake kind of thing. Yeah, I don't understand it yet. It's a snake kind of thing. Anyway, anyway, you and you notice the way he's talking. He's, like I guess, said he's talking like he's visiting like a zoo or something. Like I was visiting. We've seen all we want. Like you, you say that when you go to like a theme park or like a zoo or something like that. Huh? So they pick us. They pick up on this. Obviously, did you hear that, Mickey? He seems always wants to see. Would you say that's an insult? It was an insult. Obviously, depends. What have you seen? And then this kind of phrase, kind of weird. You can imagine this is written in like the seventies or eighties or something like that. So it's it's like the slang has changed a bit. Yeah. Anyway, you get the point. Yeah. I used to live here. He said jovially. Again, he's trying to act like he's their friend. Yeah. Like that, he's and he's lying because he hates them. Remember, he hates these people. He doesn't like them at all. He looks down on them. Yet, in his mind, these two young people are not even the same thing as he is. They're like beneath him. They're poor, so he is above them. Okay, that's what you need to keep in mind. Yeah. So everything he's saying that's nice is fake. It's all fake to try and get him out of the situation. Whilst also not, if you notice, he's not apologizing. Uh, I'm sorry, or yo, my bad. My bad, I woke you up, or uh, yo, I don't want any trouble, or how are you? Nothing like that. Yeah. He's basically nothing sincere. Yeah. Everything is fake. And at the same time, he's trying to achieve two objectives with his words. Very snake like. Yeah. One is he's trying to de escalate and make them not attack him. Okay, so he's trying to pretend like he likes them and all that. He's lying that way. And at the same time, he still can't sacrifice his ego yet. He has such a deep insecurity about you know, this need to project himself as strong and powerful and all that, even though he isn't, that he can't be sincere in apologizing or showing that they are in charge in this situation yet, that he has no strength or power in this situation. He doesn't want to look bad, so he can't apologize. And at the same time, he has no strength, like of character, to either confront them and tell them to dip, or to like be a man and you know apologize to them for uh, causing any offense, uh, even unintentional, and for waking up their family and all that. So he doesn't do anything real yet. It's all fake. It's all fake. All image yet. Okay, so finally, 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 he says, I used to live here in the old days, best years of my life. Again, he's lying, and they can pick up he's lying. <clears throat> Excuse me. He came up close and said quietly, so the, this is the young, the young guy, get out of here before we cut you up, uh, and take your camera and your bus with you. And then the other guy spits and says, calls him a tourist. Calls him a tourist, yeah. And look, he doesn't say anything back, yeah. He just gets in his car, gets, and 
they drive away. They drive away. Okay, so and then they eventually they drive to a hotel and then they're happy to be in a hotel and stuff. Um so again what you can see okay fundamentally is just tying everything up, tying it all together. From the beginning, the couple and especially the man, they knew that this place is not their home yet, connected to the title. They know that it's not their home. They know that it's not their home and it's not where they it's not where they belonged, okay? So they know that it's not their home and moreover, not just because they didn't live there anymore, but because they didn't ever want to live there and they didn't ever see themselves the same as these people yet people who lived there yet they always looked at themselves as above these people they looked at them these people the average normal working class poor person or quote unquote poor person struggling person they always they look down on these people okay they see themselves as better doing this in order to put th put them down so that they can feel good about themselves okay so the only reason they go back to this place is so that they can do that yeah they got this weird fantasy in their head Especially the man, he has this weird fantasy in his head. He kind of drags the woman along. Maybe to show off to her, to confirm that how great he is, okay? He has a strange fantasy in his head, okay? An illusion of grandeur, maybe, but not even because illusion of grandeur means that you believe you're great, yeah? He doesn't believe he's great. He just wants everyone else to believe that he's great. He isn't great. He knows he's weak. But in any case, the man goes there for the sole purpose of hurting the people who live there by flexing on them, okay? And he quickly realizes that the whole thing, uh, his deception gets laid out, yeah, basically. It's not allowed to happen, okay? Because he gets checked by reality, okay? Reality. Reality in the form of the people who live there. We're not going to play his games with them because they live a real life. Uh, and they don't have time for a weird guy talking in the middle of the night about how he used to live here. So, ultimately, ultimately, that's the that's the story, and it's a great story. Yeah, it's a great story. Uh, it connects on it hits on a lot of themes, a lot of ideas about uh, superiority, insecurity, especially insecurity. I'd say that's a major theme in the in the, in the story: insecurity desire to appear superior deception and all that um yeah it's great okay so um that's a story again like i said before uh i've started a patreon uh as soon as we start to get a bunch of people joining it i think what i'll organize is once a week maybe do a webinar and you guys can ask questions about different texts we can discuss maybe in different questions philosophy and different things like that and um uh and that's it yeah okay if you have any questions just put them put them below and i'll get to them all right take care yeah